Previously on GB Retrospectives, I mentioned something about a little treat I had in mind for this summer. Well, as you may know from the last video, the mission begins here. If you haven't seen the teaser already, I'll be looking at each of the main installments of the Metroid Prime trilogy. Starting today with the first game, which one would normally do. <clears throat> Anyways, before we get into all that, a brief synopsis of how the game starts. <clears throat> After completing her mission on Planet Zebus in the original Metroid, Samus receives a distress signal coming from the space pirate frigate Orpheon. After dealing with the Parasite Queen, the ship is set to a self-destruct sequence. On the way out, she bumps into the newer version of her arch-rival, Meta Ridley, who attempts to thwart her escape. While she manages just fine, she gets hit so hard by an explosive blast, her suit just loses all of its abilities. It just works. Now, in an inferior version of her suit, she gets into her ship and chases after Ridley to the mysterious planet below. Talon 4. Now go and explore what lies behind the only door you can access right now. So with that out of the way, let's begin the GB Retrospective's Metroid Prime Special. Just like any other Metroid game, the world of Talon 4 is a vast open world, where every room is different from the others, with vastly different regions to explore. Thing is, this is Metroid, so you generally expect that sort of thing, but not in 3D. It's part of why the Prime series is so beloved, as it's the very first title in the series to not only be in 3D, but to also be a first-person shooter. I'll get to that a bit later, though. With that in mind, the game immerses you in a way that makes you always wonder what lies behind each door, urging you to continue your exploration of this mysterious place. In terms of areas, after Frigate Orpheon that is, you've got the overgrown Talon Overworld, the desert-ridden Chozo Ruins, the lava-filled Magmore Caverns, the Arctic Glacier that is Vendrana Drifts, the Space Pirate's main base, the Phazon Mines, and at the end of the game, the Corrupted Impact Crater, each of which greatly vary in aesthetics from one another, and you can generally, for the most part, explore places at your own pace. Speaking of exploration, what better thing to talk about next than the rewards you get from doing such? Every energy tank, every missile expansion, and every power-up you get makes you more and more powerful, as one would expect, and it's all scattered out across Talon 4 for you to find. It all sets you up on a grand adventure where the pacing is up to you, and that's fun to me. Sure, while there can be a lot of backtracking, which is a word people detest these days, it's usually times where you go, Oh, I need to come back to this area with a beam that can melt all this ice so I can get the thing, and then you can return later with the needed power-up to do the thing. Or you could just wait until you hit a point where you can absolutely no longer progress and go, Well, time to go get me all the upgrades I need to get. Hell, you don't even need every single thing, and even if you want to get it all, the areas are set up in a way to where backtracking isn't a huge pain in the ass like it can be in other games. It's convenient. Getting back on track, every reward has its purpose, and if you go out of your way to get it, you won't regret it. For me, it was fun revisiting areas and going, oh yeah, I have the thing I need to do this now. Basically. The discovery of upgrades for certain things like energy tanks and more missiles incentivize the need for exploration in order to gain an advantage as early on in the game as possible. The world of Talon 4 is set up to basically be a graveyard for the Chozo who stayed there that died due to Phazon. With your handy dandy scan visor, you are given a new layer of depth to the story. Sure, while at times you use it to progress, there are a lot of optional things you can study. You can read up on what happened to the Chozo leading to their extinction, the space pirates' experiments, the biology of various creatures, etc. Even without the scan visor, the world is set up in a way where you could get your own interpretation of what happened in this bizarre place. Granted, that's if you want to look into these things. Most of the times you don't even have to. It's optional. So that's pretty cool. How to best start off the gameplay segment than with the controls? It did take me a while to sort of rewire my brain and remember certain details, like the C-Stick is not used to rotate the camera. 
Instead, you need to hold down the R button while moving the base control stick for movement. I'm most readily familiar with Metroid Prime 3's control scheme, which is based off the motion controls of the Wiimote, or the control scheme of another popular FPS series, Halo. So while the controls did take a bit to get used to again, it clicked really quickly. In fact, it was as soon as Frigate Orpheon came to a close, since the controls are set in a way that FPS veterans and newcomers alike can adapt to them quickly. To sum it up, the controls are incredibly smooth, and the placement of the buttons felt completely natural. But that just might be the GameCube controller overlord! That being said, here comes the combat section. The further you get into the game, the more challenging the creatures you fight get. Kind of a normal thing in these sorts of games, but you can really feel it here. One of my favorite encounters that really caught me off guard was the Beam Trooper Space Pirates, which have armor that adapted to your own weapons. That may make them seem impossible to fight, but their major flaw is that you need to use the beam type that matches their armor to beat them. There's also the Metroids, staple, obviously, which end up more horrifying than in the 2D games as they can actually blind you if you don't deal with them quick enough. You know, because they'll latch themselves to your fucking head. Hell, even in the frigate, you encounter living and dead space pirates with wounded in the mix. The wounded will take pot shots at you, teaching you to stay on your toes in this game. Then there's the bosses, and they're pretty damn good too. Barring, like, two of the early ones, I guess. They really put you to the test and see if you're able to figure out the patterns. Which usually, in gaming logic, means they'll be weak to whatever powers you grabbed beforehand. The only fights that I ever found to be frustrating were the Chozo Ghosts, which you start to encounter about halfway through the game, and the Fission Metroids, which pop up in the Impact Crater. These things popped up and annoyed the hell out of me. Even playing at my best, they always manage to be a pain in the ass. Let's get back to what we were talking about in the earlier section, though, about rewards. Specifically, the various power-ups. Not only are there rewards for you in the game, but you're given a brief treatment of certain abilities in the intro to not only give the player interest in the powers from the start, but also incentivize you to locate these powers again. Basically... The intro shows you what you're capable of doing, you lose these abilities, and then you learn you can get them all back. Plus some. To start us off, the Morph Ball gets plenty of upgrades, which each allow you to get to areas you wouldn't be able to access normally, either by dropping power bombs to open hatches, magnetizing to rails, boosting up half pipes like it's a fucking skate game, and just blowing debris the fuck up. Then there's the beams. And I'll admit, while all of the beams had their uses, I typically avoided using the basic power beam once I started getting upgrades in favor of more power. Aside from a few encounters when it was needed. The stun from the wave beam was effective in stun-locking enemies to death. The ice beam to missile combo was always great. And the plasma beam just melted things down so quickly. Up next are the visors, which were all pretty interesting for puzzle solutions and specific encounters. The scan visor, as I mentioned earlier, helped access certain panels and threw in some world building. The thermal visor was nice in keeping track of invisible enemies and solving heat-based puzzles. And the x-ray visor was cool when showing hidden platforms and helping face those goddamn Chozo ghosts. Now for the fun part, the suit. The power suit is a cool throwback, but that's about it. The Varia suit helps protect Samus from extreme climates like Magmore Caverns, extreme heat. The gravity suit allows for Samus to explore underwater, as though she were on the surface. And the Phazon suit makes her invulnerable to Phazon. In terms of looks, they all look as badass as you expect them to be. Of course, there's also the Fusion suit, which is a pretty neat cameo, but you can only really get it from playing Metroid Fusion, so yeah. Of course, there's also the more miscellaneous power-ups, like the space jump boots, which allow you to double jump, the grapple beam, which is the last suit upgrade that you get back, the super missile variants for each beam, which were useless to me aside from panic situations, and the phazon beam, which only shows up in the final fight. Overall, each of the power-ups are fun to experiment with, for the most part, and all serve a function towards progression. For the most part. Does Metroid Prime hold up today in terms of its visuals? Th that's a trick question and you know it. 
course, it still holds up. From the designs of Samus and the various creatures she encounters, to the vastly different zones you visit, to even the small little effects like the ice forming on Samus's arm cannon when using the ice beam, and the water landing on her visor from the rain? For a game from 2002, it still looks great in 2019. As for the sound design, it's pretty much the same. All the sound effects are crisp and help deepen the sense of immersion. Don't even get me started on the music. Every piece fits the areas it needs to perfectly, and every track is overall just fun to listen to. Look, I use this soundtrack on my Golden Brawler Hardcore Seasons a lot, because it's fucking good. Let me just cut all the sound out and let y'all jam out to some tunes. Oh, wait, Nintendo copyright issues. Well, shit. This game set up a precedent that people generally expect from a 3D Metroid game. From what we could tell though, the 3D games that derailed from this precedent were uh, not well received. Whether they be side games, or just by being this monstrosity. Oh god, get it off the screen! In terms of specific details that don't return in the rest of the trilogy, you miss things like the wave beam and thermal visor, which is unfortunate, as I did enjoy the combined applications the two things were capable of. Stealth enemy? Let's stunlock this bitch to death before he even gets a chance to jump me. Hidden power sources in the wall? Only the wave beam can reach him and finish the puzzle. There's also the ice beam and gravity suit, which in a way they kinda return, but they aren't quite the same. The Phazon suit is another thing that doesn't make a return, which kind of makes sense, but it does have a successor that I will discuss in the future. When you think about it, I guess the Phazon suit does come back in a way to haunt you for your past mistakes in a way I really enjoy. Other than that, most of these upgrades return in the future, so this really goes to show how well the first one got things right. Overall, I had a fantastic time revisiting this game. I'm hoping the next two will be as good as I remember them being. My memory is pretty fuzzy on the next title, though. While I will be ranking all of the games at the very end to see where each game kind of fits, I will say that the open world of Talon 4 has got to be the highlight of this game in particular. The environments were nicely varied, and backtracking here didn't feel like a massive chore. Unless you're looking for Chozo artifacts. That is pain unending. Aside from some minor tidbits, when I got done replaying this, I was reminded of why I love the Metroid Prime trilogy so much. Now it's time to wrap things up. But don't worry, we've still got two more games to cover. So tune in next month, where we will be looking at Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. Until then, though, thank you all for watching. Golden Brawler, out.